invited to join us. Uh, he's a, a huge part of our um, community, and OSMI is very, very close to Cake PHP Hearts. Um, as you know, Larry has supported them for years, and good reason. Um, so yeah, Ed, up to you. Over to you. Thanks, All right, thank you. Oh, that is very loud and very distorted, and I hope it doesn't feed back. Anyone on right there? We go. That's a little better. Okay, thank you very much. I'm loud, so that's going to happen. Um, yeah, my name is Ed Finkler, and I'm here to talk about uh, mental health and the developer community. Um, I, I, you know, I, I want to say for just a second that I wouldn't be here without uh, without the support of, of uh, the Cake PHP community, uh, Cake Development Corporation. And, and, and in particular, uh, Larry Masters, who uh, has done just intense, incredible, humbling work to support us over the years. And I want to thank him, and I want to really, uh, I know he's not paying attention, but I want to give him a round of applause <laughs> for supporting mental health in the tech community. Uh, something that has, uh, that he's just stepped up in a way that it hasn't. Other people have not, and 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 he, you know, that boy, that sounded a little bit mean, divisive, uh, but uh, he stepped up in a really special way, and I want to thank him for that. So you, if you're wondering who this, uh, so I've been a web developer for about 20 years, uh, mostly PHP and JavaScript, uh, some Python, some design, DevOps, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I've been doing stuff since professionally since 1997. Um, I've been a team lead. I've been a lone wolf. I've been a CTO. I've been a lot of different stuff. Uh, and I've worked in, in both uh, academia uh, and nonprofits uh, and, and in you know, regular commercial commercials kinds of stuff. And I'm a dad, I'm a husband and a local community participant, been, been, a, been on local school board, things like that. So I've done, done a bunch of different things. I've uh, at, at more than once been called a webmaster. How many of you have ever been called a webmaster? All right, that means you are old, um, like me. Yes. So. And right now, what I do is uh, I, I uh, run a thing called Open Sourcing Mental Illness, and I've been doing that since 2012. Um, and it's been a, basically it started out as speaking openly about mental illness in the tech industry. And it started out in 2012. Um, I'm the founder and chairman of the board of OSMI, Open Sourcing Mental Illness, a nonprofit 501c3 that we founded in 2016. Uh, and this is my full-time job. Uh, I do some consulting on the side, but uh, which I'll, I'll, I'll hit you up for money later, but every bit of that keeps me from having to have like a real job, and instead I get to do this, uh, which, is, which is, believe me, a much, much, much more enjoyable uh, and much more fulfilling work. I know I'm not a doctor, I'm not a psychologist, I don't have a bunch of uh, professional training in this kind of stuff. I am certified in mental health first aid, but I don't have uh, anything more than that. Um, but I'm here to talk about what it's like to have a mental illness from my perspective, the perspective as a developer, perspective as uh, somebody who's a community, open source community member, and also talk about mental health and how it affects our community and our industry. So, now we're in the uncomfortable audience participation section, and I'm going to ask you, how many of you wear glasses or contacts? You have to wear something for eyesight to correct that. Some of you are very young or not paying attention and not raising your hands, but I'm betting you most of you are. And I'm just curious, has anyone ever asked you, hey, could you cry squinting instead of wearing glasses? Has anyone ever asked you that? Okay, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry that somebody did ask you that. I think we failed you as a society, if that's the case. Um, has anyone ever said, hey, could you try harder seeing instead of not being able to see? Has anyone ever? I'm very sorry. Again, ma'am, I apologize for that. Uh, I think humanity on a whole has failed you. Um, so glass is something that lots of people deal with, and when, you know, we kind of joke around about it because it's pretty common. It's pretty common, and most of us de deal with this kind of stuff. Now, I, I, I talk about something that's still pretty common, maybe not quite as common as wearing glasses or contacts or things like that, but, but something that a lot of us deal with, which is, uh, which is diabetes, a, a widespread uh, you know, health condition. And I'm curious here, I'm not going to ask you if you have diabetes. No, I'm not going to do that. But what I am going to ask is, if you were in your workplace and the subject of diabetes came up, would you be okay talking about it? This is an audience participation section, so you really got to raise your hand. Would you, if you're comfortable with it, raise your hand. You got to raise it up. Okay. It doesn't mean you have to be excited about it. You don't come in and say, hey, Man, I had a great weekend, 
and I want to talk diabetes with everybody. Could we maybe have a stand-up meeting about that? Okay, so we're probably not going to do that. We're not going to do that. Okay. So most of us are comfortable with that, talking about that in the workplace. Now, uh, an another thing, a, 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 a more, even more severe often is cancer. And I lost a brother to cancer. Uh, and it's touched, m I'd say, most of our lives. It, it, it unfortunately touches so many people's lives. And given that, I want to ask the same question about cancer, something that we have in, in our popular culture we talk pretty openly about. We speak about, we have whole months dedicated to different kinds of cancer and things like that. Um, I'm curious, if you ask that same question, uh, would you feel okay talking about it in the workplace if it came up? I'd like you to raise your hand, again, if you'd feel comfortable talking about it if it came up. And most of us say yes, you know, I've, I've seen audiences sometimes less than that, and that's fine, that's fine. But that's a, a very serious condition, very serious condition, and different kinds of cancers are oftentimes very fatal, and, and again, it's touched most of our lives. Now, I want to ask you the same question about mental illness, about, just let's imagine a mental illness, uh, imagine one, yeah, right? Uh, let's, let's, let's take the subject of mental illness, and I ask that same question about that. Would you feel comfortable talking about that in your workplace? I'd like you to raise your hand if you would. Okay, so not bad. But far fewer people here raised their hand and a little bit less enthusiastically shot up than when we were talking about other things, you know. Um, and I think that's interesting and I want you to keep thinking about that while we discuss this and while we discuss these kinds of issues here. But back to me, the most important uh, subject, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about a couple things here. The first thing I, I deal with is, 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 is kind of the kind of stuff that I deal with. And I have these two different diagnoses. It really is just the way my brain works, but it happens to fall under these two diagnoses. The first one is called generalized anxiety disorder. And what that means is that I have fight or flight reactions when it's not appropriate to have fight or flight reactions. Now, if I looked over here and suddenly like a lion came out of here, and it was like, I'm going to eat you, Ed. And I would say, no, you're not. I'm going to roundhouse kick you. And I'd fight that line off, right? Or I would run and say, no, you're going to fight. You're going to eat these guys. And I would like push somebody a chair over, and they'd fall over on the floor, and they'd be eaten instead of me. Um, that's how I roll. <laughs> um, that, but that, that's an appropriate time to have a fight or flight reaction. That is an existential threat that, that, we're, that we're experiencing. And the problem is that I have them at the wrong times. Like I have them when somebody suggests, oh, you could just take the subway from the airport. No, I can't, I can't do that. I get so freaked out about that. Uh, I don't know how to do it. I'm going to screw it up. I'll get lost. It's terrible for me. I'm just really, 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 really bad about that. Um, so it's, and it, it, that's a time when it's not necessarily appropriate. In fact, it's incredibly not helpful to have that kind of reaction at that time. Um, a lot of times when it has to do with rules or systems that I don't understand and I'm by myself, I feel deeply uncomfortable. Even a situation with like, hey, I've got friends waiting in a bar. Uh, I'm going to go meet them. I don't, I've never been there before. Uh, I've got friends here in New York City who, have in, who invited me to like say, meet them at a place and it's nerve wracking for me because I've never been there and I'm afraid I'm gonna screw it up somehow and it, makes, it just makes me feel very uncomfortable, like something's going to go wrong. And I get that same fight or flight reaction. So, like I said, I have these reactions at times when it's not appropriate. Um, and that's really not helpful, not helpful. And then I also have ADHD, uh, which is a condition that sometimes people joke around and says, oh, that's super common with developers. I don't know if it is or not. I don't know if it is or not. But I think there's some things that we kind of think about ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Uh, there's some things that we associate with it, and those are things that I do have trouble with, like trouble staying focused on a single task, um, avoidance of less appealing tasks, like strong avoidance to the point where you like, it's, it's destructive. Like to the point where you avoid things so that they, it, it does harm to your life. Um, but there's a couple things that go along with a lot of people who have ADHD that I experience that I think we often don't uh, think about. I have a really low frustration threshold, which means that if I, and, and at the same time, my emotions can be really intense. So when I have an emotional reaction to something, um, it's often more intense than, than sort of your average person. And it often can get triggered really quickly. I get frustrated really quickly, particularly when things like 
plans change suddenly or things like that. They don't, just things don't go like the way I sort of was counting on them going. And that's really, really hard and I have a really hard, difficult emotional reaction to it. And, and combining with that ADHD and that anxiety, I'm really, really good at constructing bad outcomes because I'm good at that, the way my brain works. My brain is really good at like pattern matching and tying things together. So I'm really good at like say, taking a, some little piece of information, like my boss emails me and says, hey, um, could you come in uh, tomorrow morning and just need to talk to you about something? And uh, you know, he says this like at the end of the week, and then it's like, so I'm, then I have to wait like the whole weekend wondering what it's gonna be about. And I understand that for a lot of people that would be like, boy, I wonder what that is. But for me, I will construct a scenario in which he will figure it out everything that I've ever done bad with my life, and I am going to lose my job. Uh, and I'm going to lose my house. I'll never. I'll be blackballed from the, you know, from the industry. Never be able to get a job again. I'm gonna. This is just not gonna work out, right? And, and everything is gonna fall apart. All the people who love me are gonna leave me, and I will be homeless and alone. And that is sort of how I will live my life for the next two days, as if that is a fait accompli, as if that is inevitable. And then it kind of, you kind of, you know, you come in on one day and it's just like, oh yeah, how'd that project go? And I said, oh uh, yeah, I wrapped that up. Uh, uh, a few days ago. So we're good. And that was it. And meanwhile, I'm, you know, what I'm like, <gasps> <sighs> trying to recover. But that's what happens a lot of times with me. So I take medication. Every day I have to take some pills. I do. It's just, it, I don't like taking pills, but I have to because I'm much worse off than when I don't, if I don't take them. I'm much less happy and much, much less capable of getting stuff done. So I have a chronic conditions that don't go away. Uh, for some people, it, they experience, you know, they, they, they might take a med for a little bit and uh, things are kind of go better. They taper off, they work with their, their physician, everything's fine. In my case, I have to keep taking them. That's what I do, so I take them every day. I also see a therapist about every two weeks, although recently things have been a little more stressful. So I've been going every week to see a therapist and I talk about how and why the, I do the things that I do and try to come up with strategies to address those things so that I can be more productive and more happy and more healthy and all that stuff. And for me, a therapist is really sort of like a coach or a trainer and they help me through stuff that then they give me an outside perspective, a trained outside perspective that is really helpful and I find it really useful and it often has made me, makes my life a lot better that I go see somebody to talk with them about this stuff. But it's important to remember, at least for me, that this impacts my work every day. There's not a day that goes by that I don't have to deal with this stuff, that my brain is not affected by this thing, that the, my ability to get work done, I don't have to, I'm not challenged by things that interfere with it. And the, deal, the things that I deal with all have these issues and they come up every single day of my life. And sometimes it really gives me superpowers. I'm, I talked about, you know, brains, I'm really good at aspects of my job because of the way my brain works. And, you know, I'm good at like fast matching of different seemingly disparate things. And I used to kind of think that was just the way people all thought and the way that developers did stuff and things like that. But then it turned, I just realized after a while that there's some things that I can make certain kind of connections or see p potential, you know, connections between things that other people can't. And that's really helpful when you're doing development because a lot of it are these complex systems where you have different pieces, interconnected pieces, and finding con the connection between something like, okay, if we do this on the back end, if we store data in this kind of a data set store or something like that, how does that impact the user's ability to do X, Y, and Z? And that is really, really essential in our job because what we need to do is we, for the most part, build things for other people to use. So if we have to take into account what they're doing, and if I can make those kinds of connections across a full stack, that's really helpful. Um, I tend to anticipate security issues really quickly because I'm able to sort of make those connections. And, and I'm also just interested in human behavior. I find, things, I find those kinds of things interesting. I don't know if I'm naturally more empathetic than some other people, but I find that stuff really interesting. And I, I think a lot about why people do the things the way that they do and then apply that to the kinds of work that I do. And sometimes it absolutely ruins me. 
sometimes it craters my day and makes me completely unproductive. There are days where something comes up emotionally, uh, something comes up psychologically, and I simply cannot do my work. I can't. It is just like I got really sick with the flu, or I got, you know, I was sick in some other way. There are just times where it just, it just makes me unable to do this, especially the kind of work like this where I have to concentrate, I have to think through problems and things like that. So I think for this certain kinds of work, uh, any, any kind of work that really engages those kinds of things, but certain, you know, less rote work, you know, mental health issues I think particularly impact those. And I, that's been my experience, um, that it really, really costs me productivity. And the worst times and the hardest times have always been when I felt alone, and I felt utterly alone among crowds of thousands. Like me being alone in this city, uh, if I'm not with a friend or when I'm not, not with people that I know, is really, really difficult for me. And I naturally get uncomfortable in those situations. But sometimes when you, ha when you deal with the issues like I deal with, you feel really incapable of like coping, of living this life. You feel like, I get freaked out in a city like this, but everybody else seems to be okay. What's wrong with me? Um, and you feel like you're always going to screw up and you're always going to ruin something. And everyone that you love will grow tired of me and leave. And that, is, that, that seems like an inevitability. Um, when you feel alone and you feel, and, and, and the fact that we discuss these things so infrequently, we think that we're alone in those feelings. And I have felt that way for most of my life, in fact. But there's actually lots of people who feel this way. There's lots of people. In fact, the general number that you see of people who deal with a mental health disorder in a given year in the United States is about 20% of the general population. So one in every five people. That's just the general population. So there's a lot of people who deal with this kinds of stuff. And that's what we're trying to fight with OSMI. So if we're going to look at the worldwide community, we're going to look at sort of like general population sorts of things. I'm going to need a drink here for a second. Talk amongst yourselves. All right. If we look at the worldwide community, I can, we can look at a study that the World Health Organization did in 2008, and that was the last one they did, it was called the Global Burden of Disease, the last study, they, the last Global Burden of Disease study that they did. And what they found in that was that the burden of mental disorders is the largest of all disorder categories of, in North America. And it's greater than cardiovascular disease and greater than cancer. This disease burden is a metric that they come up with to basically measure the impact of, on a disease as, uh, or a type of disease, category of disease on a population. They found in North America that the burden of mental disorders is the largest. And then here's a quote from that same study, which is big. You can go download the PDF. It's like 300 pages. In all, it's got lots of charts and fun stuff like that. So if you're really into that kind of stuff, it's great. In all regions, the neuropsychiatric conditions are the most important causes of disability accounting for around one-third of years lost to disability among adults aged 15 years and over. One-third of years lost to disability worldwide are caused by neuropsychiatric conditions. That's enormously impactful. Enormously impactful. Let's talk about the tech community. Slide that down, kind of just look at, let's look at this. From what we can tell, there's basically been very little or no research done in the tech community. So that's what a lot of what we do, is we do research. Um, and we do a lot of that survey-based stuff and do analysis on that kind of data. So this is information from our last survey, which was the 2016 Mental Health and Tech Survey. Um, and this is as of November 16th. Now this only includes people in the US. And this only includes non-self-employed people. The reason why we did only people in the U.S. is because the healthcare system is different in the U.S. than many other countries. And also non-self-employed because we wanted to do a little more measurement. And the stuff I wanted to present here deals a lot with what the workplace is like and what employers, you know, how, how they interact with those kinds of stuff. So I'll, I'll, get, I'll show you a few different things here. So the first thing. Do you think that discussing a health issue with your employer would have negative consequences? And we asked about physical health and we asked about mental health. 
So with physical health, 72% of people said no. There would not be negative consequences for discussing a, a, a physical health issue with their employer. Only 4% said yes. So that's a very small number. With mental health, 23% of people said yes. Five times people, uh, five times the respondents uh, think there would definitely be negative consequences. Half as many said no, significantly more said maybe. Would you bring up a health issue with a potential employer in an interview? And again, we asked about physical health and we asked about mental health issues. So with physical health, only 24% of people said yes. That's not a surprise. Um, a lot of people said they don't want to do anything to uh, you know, interfere with, with their uh, job possibilities. You know, why bring it up? things like that. Um, there are laws in the United States that are supposed to protect you from discrimination, but they're difficult to enforce and prove. They can say that you weren't a culture fit, you know, uh, and, and, and just put it at that. Uh, again, maybe 40%, 36 no, 24 yes. Now let's look at mental health issues. Only 7% of people said yes, so far, far fewer said yes, they would bring that up. Uh, and about twice as many said no about twice as many. So the, the belief is, especially with mental health issues, that that would be a real deal breaker. And that's what we saw in the respondents when we asked why. You know, when they wrote out a response that said, there's no way, that would be a red flag for anybody. I would never bring it up. So another question we asked, does your employer provide resources to learn more about mental health issues and how to seek help? Only 30% of people said yes. 33 said don't know, which is probably about like a no, and 37% said no, that they didn't provide any resources about mental health issues and how to seek help. And I think it's important to remember that, particularly in the United States, where the workplace is the primary conduit for health care. And it is frequently the case in the United States, and I think elsewhere, that wellness programs are a major part of what employers work on in order to keep people happy, healthy, and productive. Um, but for the most part, engagement on mental health issues has been very poor. And another, uh, I think a final question that I think it was, is interesting. Do you feel that being identified as a person with a mental health issue would hurt your career? And 87% said yes or maybe. Only 12% said no, it has not, or no, I don't think it would. So I think it's something to ask while we're talking about this, is that the way that should be? Is it the way it should be? And why is it that way? And I'll show you another, uh, I'll show you one other slide, but I want you to remember that the survey is self-selecting. You choose to, uh, to, to uh, respond to the survey. Now the results I'm showing here represent about 800, 850 respondents. So it's a large selection. But it's by no means like a, you know, we didn't have a control group, it's by no means completely random. Um, but we asked the question, have you been diagnosed with a mental health condition? And remember I talked a little bit about what numbers are in the, in the general belief in the U.S. We're talking about about one in five deal with something in a given year. And the numbers that we got back from, these no from here was 50%. Now this is self-reported, so it's probably the case that this is higher than you would see normally. But I think there's still good evidence that in the uh, tech industry and among tech professionals, IT professionals, that we're talking about a number that's higher than the general population. And you can also just make the argument too that one, sick workers don't work and it doesn't matter what they're sick with and they're significantly less productive if they do that. And at the same time, that mental health issues impact people who deal with intellectual problems more severely it impacts their productivity more severely than it would for somebody who's not dealing with those kinds of things. So the kind of work that you, we all do in here is significantly more impacted by these kinds of things. So what's the upside if we're trying to talk about that, especially if we're talking about like, well, what do we do in the workplace? How do we change these kinds of, kinds of things in the workplace? Um, you know, how do we, how, you know, what's the upside for an organization to take this seriously and change this? Well, because it benefits the organization and it benefits everybody in it. Because mental wellness means better employees. Employees feel valued and secure and work more effectively 
when employers demonstrate a commitment to their well-being. They do. If we think about the kinds of jobs we've had in the past, typically the ones that I look at at least, most positively, are ones where that happened, where they demonstrated a commitment to my well-being, where they demonstrated a real concern about what I was dealing with, what I was going through, where there was a balance for that. And jobs where they didn't do that are usually ones that I look back on and view quite negatively. And people want to work for companies like this. More people want to work in some place that respects them fully and doesn't ignore their well-being. So you're going to get better productivity, you're going to get better hires, and you're going to get increased retention. So that's a pretty good investment. I mean, some, I remember just having this conversation that uh, you lose an employee, what's well, the cost? Thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 maybe. Investing uh, uh, half that in a detailed analysis and wellness program in your company is going to save you money if, it's, if it just retains one person. My friend Greg Bogus and I were talking about this, and he told me, we talk about 10x developers as kind of like his fairy tale, right? But if you take a developer with crippling depression, which, by the way, severe depression has been compared to quadriplegia in terms of the impact that it has on somebody's uh, way of life. If you take a developer with crippling depression and then get them the right treatment, they literally will be 10 times more productive. So if you're talking about why, make an, why should an organization care about this, this is why. Because you get more and better and more effective employees who want to work for you and they stay there. But change is really hard because it's scary, we don't know what to do, there's questions about that kind of stuff. We might be afraid, uh, we might be afraid of endangering our workplace, we might be afraid of losing our jobs, we probably all are. People who are in decision making positions often are afraid that, well, if I do the wrong thing, this could screw up stuff for everybody. Or we're afraid of losing our jobs because we say, if I speak up about this, maybe I'm, if I speak openly about things I'm dealing with, ew, that could be, I mean, clearly we've demonstrated that uh, from the survey information. Now, at OSMI, that's basically what we exist to do, is to help individuals and employers deal with these issues. But I'm going to give you three things that you can do right now. The first thing is you can get the OSMI handbooks that we have. And there's a handbook for employers and employees. It talks about how to navigate um, in the US the Americans with Disability Act and how to navigate those laws and as they apply to mental health in the tech workplace. And also, we have another handbook that talks specifically about creating supportive workplaces to promote mental wellness. If you sit down, you do this kind of work, you're going to be immensely better prepared for this. And these books are free. We give them away their Creative Commons license. The second thing is talk, making a decision to speak openly about mental health. And that doesn't mean you speak openly about the issues that you may deal with or may not deal with. That's not what that means. You don't have to all be like me and overshare, right? Um, and and that's, that's, that's normal. You shouldn't have to do it. But speaking openly about the topic of mental health and speaking about it as something that's to be taken seriously, not a joke, or not something that we should be ashamed of, that will have a dramatic impact on the people around you. Every experience I've ever had with speaking about this stuff, and I've gotten feedback from, um, feedback, I've had I've got numerous anecdotes from people who've told me about this, that they've said that when somebody speaks openly about this stuff, it makes them, if they feel empowered and safer and more likely to go and get help if they need it, or, the way that they interact with people or think about these kinds of things is significantly changed. So it makes a huge difference. You have great influence on the social groups and communities around you, so it's important to use it. And thirdly, telling people that they matter. And this is kind of, you know, it's a little fuzzy here, here, that's fine. But I think telling people how they impact your life positively and how strong and how great they are and that you admire them, People, everybody needs to hear this. We're social creatures. We need to hear these kinds of things. But particularly people whose brains lie to them. My brain lies to me all the time, every single day. And it is important to hear that and to hear that from other people around you because it makes their lives a lot easier. 
But I want to bring this back, kind of bring this back down, down to its essence, because I talked about some numbers, I talked about some things like this, but the stories and the things that people say are what really, I think, tells us why we, this is why we care is because we think we hear about it, people that we know. And these are all things that I'm going to share with you. These are all from people in our communities, our open source communities, PHP developers, other kinds of developers. And these are all a few quotes. These are, I'm going to just share a couple of quotes for with you. These are all from developers. It really sucks to have a brain that, that wants to continually sabotage you and keeps you from reaching your potential. This is from another person. I always wanted to go out and meet others in the development field, but I can't get myself to go to any of the meetups or conferences. I'd go to one day conference, I'd gone to one day conference, but it was too nervous to talk with any of the other attendees. I felt, like, felt a left feeling like an idiot for not introducing myself to anyone. I, I felt that way a lot because I'm just too nervous to talk to people, people I don't know. I've often felt that way. I go to tons of conferences, but I had to force myself. It was hard to do that. And I get proper care for my conditions. This is a, from a message somebody sent to me. I deal with generalized anxiety disorder and take the same meds as you do. I first noticed this condition as a teenager, and I'm almost 30 now. I'm still incredibly embarrassed about the condition and most likely will not tweet about this topic out of pure shame, unfortunately. If we think about it, that's really what holds us back. But sometimes I have to question the values that we have in our culture and in our society. I don't know if, did anyone else see this on Twitter the other day? Maybe it was just yesterday. It was some show about uh, called Planet of the Apps, which is going to be on, I, I guess, an Apple-produced TV show, I guess. Cool. Okay. And I'm not trying to pick on this guy, but this is a common thing. He says, I rarely get to see my kids. That's a risk you have to take. What are our values? Are these our values? Do we allow them to be our values because we don't call it out? Because a lot of times I think we don't. And values like this contribute directly to mental health problems in our industry. They contribute directly to people being sick, to lessen productivity, to lowered retention, to burnout, to sick workers. So as long as we keep thinking that this is an okay thing for us to say and do and think, it's a real problem. Because the way it drives us is it drives us into the ground. Because communities are about people, not code. Code is like a MacGuffin. It's the stuff that brings us together. But these communities are made up of people, and the people are what's important. The people are the story. And we're talking about our community our cake PHP community, our general PHP community, our open source web development community, and wider than that. We're talking about our colleagues, the people that we work with every single day, people that we interact with, people we count as friends, our friends. We're talking about our people here. And a lot of them, because of attitudes and fear and shame, suffer in silence. And sometimes we lose them. We either lose them because they drop out of our lives, we lose them because they take their own lives. I've seen this happen too many times within our community. And we're left to wonder and regret and try to understand why this happened. And there's some people we can save and there's some that we cannot. But the only reason this happens is fear. Only fear allows this to be the case. Only fear allows this to be okay. The only reason we allow so many to suffer in silence is fear. And the only reason we don't save more of our kin and our kith is fear. That's it. So we have to choose. We all choose every single day. We all choose. You choose and I do and we all choose. We can choose to give in to fear. We can choose to hide or be silent or be quiet 
and not speak up when we see things like this. This kind of thing I'm asking you to do, it's not for people who are indifferent or are content to be comfortable. This is hard change. But I think that we can meet inaction with action. And I think that we can meet confusion with understanding. And I think we can meet indifference with compassion if we choose to be stronger than fear. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. Now I'm going to give you a little, little ask here. It, it is the case that, that, that Larry has been kind enough to, to match. Uh, we want to raise $3,000 and he's going to match that $3,000. Um, I know there's a lot of people who are watching on the stream, a lot of people who are in here. If you can give a small amount of money even, if you just visit the website, it would really, really help us out. I stepped down from a CTO role to do this full time because I think it's that important. And I, th I hope that you agree that it's that important too. And if you can take the time and give a little bit of money, that would really help out and we're gonna get matching contributions from Larry and that's just huge. So if you can help me out, I'd really appreciate it. Thanks again.